the book of Titus, so I would encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to that New Testament book. Uh, you remember Titus was left on the island of Crete to set things in order, to straighten things out uh, there on that island as there, the church was, was growing and developing and people were turning to the Lord, but there were also problems there at, at that time. And, and one of the things that he was to do was to set elders in place everywhere, in every town wherever there was a church. And so he's been talking to us this last uh, several weeks about what kind of men should those men be. And he talked about their moral life. He talked about their family life. He, he talked about their personal lives and how they act and interact with other people there. And, uh, and he talked about their, their, their outreach, their hospitableness, their their control, their holiness, their discipline, their example, all many things there that we've read already. And, and today we're up to verse 9 in this particular chapter there. And so let's read that together. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Just one verse. Let's pray over this and let's look at it together. Father in heaven, the richness of your word, the greatness of it, bring down upon us by the Holy Spirit's power that our hearts may be willing and obedient to it and that we would desire to always walk in your ways. So help us in our understanding of this text this morning and may it bless us with the way that we live in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read that verse 9 again. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This idea of holding firm to the word, of preaching the word, of standing upon the word is all over uh, the gospels and especially the pastoral epistles. If we go to 1 Timothy and read verse 9, it, it would say to us, holding fast the faithful word. And, and you remember that uh, in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, God describes the, the word as, as the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, this double-edged instrument to, to, to cut and to slash and to defend. That is the word. And, and the elders and the ministers of any faithful congregation are commanded to do that. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, you should be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And he defines that by saying, constantly nourished on the words of faith and sound doctrine, which you have been following. In verse 11 of that same chapter, it says that you are to command and to teach these things. Uh, give attention to the reading of Scripture, it says. Exhort, exhorting and teaching. In verse 14, don't neglect the spiritual gift within you, that gift of preaching. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. In 1 Timothy, again, in another place, it says we, we, uh, we have just a multitude. Preach the word in season, out of season. That's 2 Timothy there. Listen to all those words, though. Command, teach, explain, apply. Don't neglect your gift. That's what the elders and ministers of the church of Jesus are to be like. And why is that? Because Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says it's for the perfecting of the saints there. In uh, chapter uh, 3 of 2 Timothy he, he says the, the, the word of God is inspired and that it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, for training in righteousness and so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. A 
Again, 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, be ready in and season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction there. What does that tell us about the leadership of the church? That it's not to be based upon ingenuity. It's to be based upon the <clears throat> exposition and the application of the word of God. It's not to be based upon our experiences or even the, the experience of the leader. It's not to be based upon common sense. It's not to be based upon books that we might have read and, and, or other leaders have written or about techniques from industry or wherever it is, psychology, whatever it is. It's the Word, the Word, which causes people to grow. It's the Word which causes sin to be exposed. It is the Word which lays out the will and the purpose of God and how we are to walk in that purpose in our lives there. But to come back to Titus here now, it says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. This is a necessary foundation for the right kind of leadership in the church. Paul says it's essential, Titus, that the men that you're seeking out are men who are men of the word. But it doesn't just say that that they're real men of the word. It says they hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Some of the real villainy today in the church is that men are in the church who pretend to hold firm to the word, but don't really listen to it. They're listening to all other kinds of things and then they're preaching those as if they were the Word of God. The, the Greek word here says to hold fast. It means to cling, to hold tightly. It's the, the same word that's uh, used. No man can have two masters. He will cling to the one or despise the other. If faithful and godly leadership is not clinging holding fast to the word, essentially they're despising it in some regard. So it's not just a commitment to the inspiration of the scriptures, which we ought to be committed to. It's not just commitment to inerrancy, it's it, as important as that is. It's a commitment to the, the singularity, to the, the, to the uniqueness of the word of God. Like we read earlier, Paul said to Timothy, retain the standard of sound words. Guard the treasure of the scripture that has been committed to you. You're not just to love it and, and believe it, but you're to understand its uniqueness, its greatness, its power in this world. He calls it in verse 9, a trustworthy, a faithful word. As taught. Now, what's he juxtaposing that over against? Unfaithful words, untrustworthy words in this world. You know, for Paul, he says there is only one food for the soul, it's the only thing that can take a person and make him perfect. Thoroughly furnished to all good works, as we read there in 2 Timothy. Psalm 19 says it this way. Uh, I love the way it says it. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of God, the word of God, is that which can change you. And the only thing which ultimately can change you as a person in this world. It says in verse 9, hold fast, cling to that trustworthy word as, and it says, as taught. It adds another dimension to this. The teaching is, is a reference to the apostolic doctrine. Remember chapter uh, 
2 of Acts, what did the new believers do? They, they fellowshiped with one another, they worshiped, they broke bread together, and they paid attention to the apostolic teaching there. Already way back in Acts 2, it was decided there are certain things that are true and there are certain things that are not true. And we hold as the true churches of Jesus to the apostolic teaching. That's why I, I liked it that uh, I didn't even plan that, but we sang the Apostles' Creed there. Something coming down to us from the fourth century of Christianity and enduring to today. Why, why, how could a document like that endure so long? Because it's the apostolic teaching. It's the truth. It's the didasco. This is, this is what the ministers and the elders are to, to do with their lives in the midst of the congregation there. The truth doesn't need to be redacted or edited or changed or updated it's to be clung to that revelation of God is to be clung to we're not people who are to innovate we are not uh, to come up with new things when it comes to the church of Jesus you know you you just shudder when you sometimes see and, and hear preaching which which uh, is obviously been a um, affected by the culture around us, changed by the prevailing attitudes that are out there outside of, of, of the Word of God and outside the doors of the church. Hold fast there. It has the sense of exclusivity. Okay? We're loyal to it we, because we, we're devoted to what God says. We are to be people of the Word of God. And we see it happening in the churches today that, that it's all about relevancy or psychology or, or this new idea or that political movement within society. And, and the teaching of the church gets changed and that's a very, it's a very violation of what Titus is saying here. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. So you have to have that foundation within any church that's going to be successful. We've been talking about churches that need to endure for generations, perhaps. Well, Paul says you need the right kind of men to lead them. And at the, you might say, the capstone of what he says about that, even beyond their character and their abilities, is their fidelity they're clinging to what God has revealed in his word. Now beyond that, he says, there are also two necessary duties to take up with that word. He says there, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. A, a, a positive and a negative here. To be a faithful minister of the word, to be a faithful follower of the word, to be a faithful leader, but also to be a faithful member, we are to be instructed in sound doctrine. Instructed in sound doctrine. Now that's... Uh, <clears throat> This word instruction is, is parakaleia in the, in the Greek. It means to call alongside. We use that, that same sort of, sort of construction in English today in the word like paralegal. Someone who comes alongside the lawyer. A, a paratrooper. Someone who jumps out of an airplane to come alongside his, his fighting friends in the army. And uh, it's, it's also the famous word that's used for paraclete of the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside us, the strengthener, the comforter. Well, that's what the Word is to do for us. It's to come alongside us. 
And it's to be preached in such a way that it is then personal to us. Now he's talking about sound doctrine, and, and, uh, but that means that there's also unsound doctrine there in the world. That everything is not just equal. That you can't always just say, well, it's just their opinion and our opinion and, and we'll agree to disagree. When it comes to the matters of God and His Word, it's the responsibility to come alongside of the congregation in sound doctrine. That's why uh, James, by the way, says, don't always run off to be a teacher because your judgment will be greater. I'm paraphrasing James chapter 3, verse 1 there. It's better not to be a leader. It's better not to be a preacher unless you are willing to cling to the truth and to proclaim the truth and to come alongside people with the truth and to be unapologetic and unashamed of what God says in this world here. Now Ezra in chapter 7 of his book says, Ezra set his heart to study the law of God and to practice it and to teach it. This idea is nothing new. It's, it's run all the way through the Old Testament as well, beloved. And in fact, we could go clear back to the garden. And what was the original mistake? And what was the original temptation? What did Satan, that snake, say to Eve in the garden? Did God really say this? I mean, maybe you misunderstood. Or he's holding you back. All those implications from that statement there. What was he doing? He was questioning the word of God. And that is always the trail to destruction and disaster in the world today too. Maybe God really didn't mean that when he said it. Maybe really... You know, it was just obscured by culture and time. Maybe they weren't, didn't have the modern uh, uh, education that we have. But beloved, see how that calls into question who God is when you say something like that? What you're essentially saying is God is either ignorant or stupid or evil. Because he said this, and it really doesn't apply to us. So that you may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. It says of Apollos, you remember in, in the book of Acts, he was mighty in the scriptures. In our society today, the new thing is to be relevant. The new thing is to be user-friendly. And, and, and the, the, I'm sorry, beloved, but the scriptures are not very user-friendly. They're not very entertaining many times. They don't make people feel comfortable. That may, it makes them feel guilty and out of sorts there. And ministers aren't called here to make you feel good about yourselves. I mean, I hope you can feel good about yourselves as you obey the Word of God. But we're, to, we're called here to instruct you in sound doctrine. And the failure to do that in the churches, in our country, and around the world is, is to fail to understand the obvious implications of this text here in Titus. You're either indifferent to those implications or, or you're ignorant of them or you're prideful thinking that you have something better to say than what God has said. 
Uh, C.H. Spurgeon said, It's blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in the scriptural language and your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. This is what we're, we're shooting for, beloved. That kind of clinging to, that kind of fidelity to the word. That on the positive side, on the negative side, Titus goes on to say this, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, the obvious implication of that is that there were um, false teachers. There were contradictory people behind the scenes there. We don't have to go very far to find that, do we? In verse 10 it says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcised party, and they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what ought not to be taught there. So there's the second um, application, if you would, of this principle of clinging to the word, not only exhorting and preaching its truthfulness, but being a little bit polemic, contradicting those who do not stand for the truth. The, the Greek word here is the Greek word antelego, which means to say against, to speak against something. And in this case, it's to speak against those who do not accept the Word of God, those who oppose sound doctrine. We live in a day where we have to continue to do that too. You know, right now we're being washed over by the transsexual movement and the, the, the wave of people who are, who are giving that, that they're, they're patting that on the back. Genesis chapter 2 says, though, that man was created in the image of God, male and female. It's pretty clear, guys, that God creates you either one way or another way. Psalm 139 says, in my mother's womb I was created. God was watching my bones form. He knew what was happening there. And in a day like this, it's up to us who believe the Scriptures to stand up for them and say, enough of this nonsense. You are what you are, and it's in your rebellion against God that you want to change who you are. That God made you in the way that He wanted to make you. And your refusal to accept that is, is a refusal of God's word and, and the Almighty's work in your life. It's kind of simple, really. But we need to stand in the marketplace, brothers and sisters, and say, this is what God says. We don't care what the psychologists say. We don't care what the... The, this professional or the school officials might say or somebody else might say, it's clear God made them fee, female and male. So do not fall into the trap of, of living in the, the cultural slime of our day. Because for the sake of their souls, you must bring them to the truth. Now, you don't have to be unkind. You don't have to be bitter and rancorous. But your statements will contradict what they're saying. And that's a loving contradiction if it's done in the power of the word and, and, in the, and, and in the, with the blessing of our God. Another example from today, and then we'll, we'll close here shortly, but uh, you know, this whole Proposition 3 thing. Exodus chapter 20 says, you shall not murder someone. And yet for 50 years, we've had murder among us in this country. The legal killing of babies in the womb. That's blood on the ground, guys. That's not a, a, just a, a little 
question of tissue or something. This is a direct violation of God's word. Okay, who says not to murder people. Now, for 50 years, we've been held out of this discussion. I mean, we've been able to verbally speak our mind, but we've been able to, uh, uh, we've been held out of the choice of this. Now in November, and I'm not a politician, I'm speaking about morality here, not politics. Now in November, you finally have a voice in this. Before the courts held you out, they wouldn't allow your voice to be heard. But in this very state, with this Proposition 3 coming up, which is the legal slaughter of the innocent, you have a choice. Now I want to ask you something. If you're going down the road and, and somebody is being murdered in front of you, could you stop your car and take the day off work if all you had to do was throw a piece of paper out the window to save their life? I hope you could. I hope you're convinced of the Word of God enough that you will. So I'm saying something that I've never said from the pulpit before. You have a responsibility to vote this November. If you're not registered, but if you're old enough, you better get out and register. You better do what's right and follow the Word of God. And put that piece of paper, lest this state become a cesspool of blood, and it will become one of the states that are, is full of blood if this proposition passes, because it's a direct contradiction of God's sixth commandment. So I don't care if you have to take the day off work, if it costs you 150 bucks because you can't get to work that day. You better throw that paper out the window and save the life of the innocent there, based not upon which political party you belong to, but based upon the morality of the Word of God there. This is what Paul is talking about. You know, we, we used to throw our hands up and say, we can't do anything because the Supreme Court has ruled, the Supreme Court has said, and we really couldn't do much. But now we have an opportunity, us in this state especially here, we have the opportunity to say no to this bloodshed in our midst. And it's going to be on our consciences, beloved, if we don't do that as the people of God. We cling fast to the Word. We're not going to cling fast to what society says about this issue or all their multitude of arguments. It comes down very simply to this commandment, you shall not kill. I don't care what extraneous arguments are made. That child in the womb had nothing to do with whatever circumstances happened around them. And God says, don't let them be killed. This is the kind of thing that Paul is talking about here. Fidelity to the word means positively bringing us alongside of the word, but it also means contradicting that which is evil and that which is wrong. That's the way that the world is going to be brought to the feet of Jesus. Not by going along with their every whim, their every idea. It's going to be brought to the feet of Jesus by this exhortation and preaching and fidelity to the Word of God and by us contradicting wherever they're going astray as well. Well, that, that sort of concludes Paul's, uh, Titus's discussion here. Of the right kind of man. The kind of man that you want to lead you and your children and your grandchildren into the next generations. God grant us that we always get those kind of men here in our congregation. 
uh, as, as we uh, would go forward to. Shall we pray? We ask, Father, for that same fervor and desire in all of our hearts to keep your word, to love your word, and to obey it no matter the cost to us that we may glorify your name in the generation in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen.